Hello everyone and welcome to ML Dan. Today we have the absolute pleasure of having Dr. Adil Razi from Monash University on ML Dan. Now, Dr. Adil Razi is an associate professor at Monash University in Australia, where he leads the computational neuroscience laboratory at the Turner Institute for Brain and Mental Health. He is a computational neuroscientist who combines mathematical and experimental methods in his research. His laboratory is highly interdisciplinary, incorporating engineering, physics, and machine learning to address neurobiological questions and advance our understanding of the brain. His work has potential applications in developing neuroscience-inspired artificial intelligence, treating brain diseases, and creating neurotechnologies. Welcome, Dr. Razi. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me to your podcast. It's my pleasure. Okay, so I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, so let's just get started. I prepared some questions. Um, so first and foremost, could you please talk a little about uh, your computational and systems uh, neuroscience lab at Monash University and the focus of the research in, in there? Yes. Um, so I moved to Monash in 2000, 2018. And I was before at University College London. Um, and when I established my laboratory about five years ago, um, so um, the, there were a few areas that I picked. Uh, one of them is uh, what I have been doing before as a postdoc at UCL, which is to continue that field of work, which is on developing new uh, MRI methods, uh, especially to infer um, in vivo uh, brain connectivity from functional MRI, um, especially. But we also do some work now on uh, on electronic, uh, you know, EEG and MEG as well. Um, so mainly, we have been working on developing dynamic causal modeling framework uh, with its pioneer, Professor Carl Friston. Uh, so that's something that's ongoing with a special focus on the resting state functional MRI. So, um, so that's one area of work where we develop methods related to dynamic causal modeling with a focus on resting state functional MRI. Uh, the second focus area was on psychedelics. Um, and uh, for this, um, uh, we have uh, actually started and completed Australia's first and world largest um, um, psilocybin and brain imaging trial at Monash. We started that in 2019 and we finished the data collection, um, uh, the imaging part of it in, in late last year. Um, and uh, we are currently analyzing that data and that would be available uh, soon, both the first uh, set of findings and also the, the data set will also be made open access. So we are working on that. So that's the second um um, of our of our um lab, and then the last but not the least is to develop um the neuroscience inspired artificial intelligence techniques. Uh, this is what we call um uh, active inference. Uh, so this is something an ongoing work where we're developing better uh better AI models which are inspired by uh, how the brain does things. Um, in this respect, we have been collaborating with a startup um, which is local in Melbourne um, called Cortical Labs, and uh, I will talk a bit more about that project on Dish Brain later on. So that these are the three different uh, three three ways, you know, three different um, what you call strengths of the lab. Um, yeah. And so when you talked about uh, improving AI, uh, as far as I know, is this where the main focus is on poor credit assignment and deep learning models? Um, so the idea here is this, that develop more, develop models which are more generalizable, which are more explainable. Yeah. The issue with, the, with deep learning right now is, is that the models while they can do wonderful things um, like ChatGPT, which is basically um, work with text, 
uh, but of course limited in uh, what it can do with other modalities like uh, like uh, you know uh, um, like video or audio recordings and it's not multimodal in that sense um, but also that it requires a huge amount of training data and also a huge amount of efficient energy to to train these models while we know that our brains don't require all of that we can generalize we can do continual learning so the idea here is of course uh, i can talk about credit assignment and 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 continual learning but the idea the main idea here is this that try to to um um what you say the bridge the gap between current ai and and human uh human intelligence and learning capacity yeah uh, this is actually uh, something that um i was ho i would hope to see more researchers in the machine learning community start focusing on because that's i think there's a lot of merit to it and obviously there are amazing things that our brain can do that deep learning models suffer from so i'm really looking forward to the outcome of your research on that um so you also about about this uh, huge survey indeed the largest um sort of um, study that has been done ever in the world psi connect that you were talking about uh, these uh, magic mushrooms uh that that uh, sort of i, I think you've, you've been given these uh, psychedelics to adults uh, i think around 60 people or so and gathered neuroimaging data uh, like the fmri EMRI, EEG, and so on. You mentioned that, if I'm not mistaken, that looking at how their, the brain reacts to these compounds will give a window into understanding the hard problem of consciousness. Can you explain the connection between this experiment and this amazing outcome? Yes. Um, so I am an electrical engineer and I try to understand things by breaking them, by destroying them, by trying to, uh, you know, um, so how the things look like from inside. For I need to, for this, I need to change them. I should have some control over them. So when I started my lab, and and um, we wanted to look at consciousness as as one of the important topics. Uh, so. I look at psychedelics as a way to change consciousness. You know, I can reversibly change. I can, I can, I can control in a sense that I can control people's mind with these drugs and then record while they are having hallucinations, while they're having ego dissolution. In real time, I can record the brain imaging. Um, you know uh, the, these recordings of, of how the brain is doing is is what what's happening in the brain. Uh, that's fascinating to me. Um, so that's the idea here. Uh, psychedelics, as you probably know, uh, they have a huge potential to treat various mental health issues like PTSD, you know, depression and 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 anxiety and and all that. However, my interest is not very clinical, although some, some lab members in my group, they have those interests in psychedelics as a therapeutic, uh, you know, uh, tool to, 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 to uh, treat mental health problems. But my own interest is to use psychedelics as a way to alter mind and then uh, record what's happening in the mind or the brain and understand the neural basis of altered states of consciousness. Uh, so this is, this is what we are trying to do in this experiment, which is to give people uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin, as you said, is a, a you know, active compound, a active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Um, and we gave it to 60 people uh, there are two groups in this. Half of them uh, did an eight weeks of meditation course. So they did a MBCT eight weeks meditation and other group didn't do it. But both groups were given psilocybin. So there are two interventions here. 
One is meditation, and other is the psilocybin. Um, and then we recorded the brain imaging, the the, the brain images uh, using MRI and also EEG. And um, we had two time points. We did it without drug, and also with drug. Um, so this is a very complex uh, study. It took a long time to get ethics approval because we are working with healthy people as well. So they have no um, no uh, history of uh, psychiatric illness as well. So it's a complicated trial. It took many, you know, a couple of years to just to do, uh, get all the approvals and administrative hurdles that we had to jump. Um, but once it's all done, we have uh, finished collecting data and we are analyzing this. But as you said, you know, um, the main idea here is this, that how we understand how these drugs are acting in the brain. So, um, so there's a gap in knowledge that we know that they can help with uh, various disorders but we actually don't exactly know how they act in the brain. Because in our study, we have seen that uh, people react to these drugs in a very different way. There's a huge spectrum of, of, um, of uh, how um, people have reacted to these drugs. Some people just find it not so they don't have they don't feel any um much effects of it they, they feel like they had they are just a little bit drunk um while others will have a profound um profound acute effects of eager dissolution disembodiment uh synesthesia uh so we actually don't understand we give everyone the same same uh uh, the same amount of uh, 19 milligram of psilocybin, but the 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 um, what the what we measure as behavior is very different across people. And then we are now looking at what's actually happening in the brain as well, uh, how the changes in neural connectivity uh, or brain connectivity changes in people with and without drug, and in, uh, with and in people with meditation and no meditation. So there are lots of uh, questions there to 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 answer um, but the main thing here is to uh, is to plug the gap between uh you know the therapeutic outcomes and and understanding that how these drugs work in the brain how they act in the brain so by measuring the distance or difference in the brain imaging that you have before and after taking the magic mushroom by measuring this difference you are trying to understand consciousness like this has altered consciousness yeah so we can for example try to understand uh, and we have already written some 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 uh, previous uh, work or we have done some previous work on this um for example, what are the mechanisms of ego dissolution? So when someone is, so under one of the most um, profound subjective effect of psilocybin or psychedelics is this that people feel, uh, you know, um, ego dissolution. So there's a blurring of boundary between what's outside and what's inside. So while this is a very profound subjective experience that most people will have, under psychedelics, what is actually happening in the brain at that time? What brain networks are involved? How they change, how they communicate with each other changes. For example, uh, we have shown um, and provided some evidence that uh, so there are different brain networks in the brain like default mode network. Uh, so default mode network is about internal processing. It's about the self. Um, and then there are there are networks like uh, dorsal attention networks. So they are about the external. They engage in the when someone is ex, is engaged in in attentional tasks or giving attention to external things. Uh, and there are things like um, network like a salience network, which which modulates the. Um, the the the, uh, the 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 internal and external focus and these networks are anti-correlated. Default mode network is anti-correlated with 
uh, with the dorsal attention network. That's a very classic finding in functional imaging. Um, so what we have uh, seen is this that under psych under under LSD, for example, which is a another classical psychedelic, synthetic psychedelic compound, uh, we see that this anti-correlation between these two brain networks um, fades away, which means they are no more anti-correlated, but they are actually in the sink, which means that these two networks, one which is one is about internal world, another is about external world, they sync with each other. And that's probably how uh, people are getting the subjective experience of ego dissolution. So there are some interesting findings that we have, but we are trying to now let, look more deeper. That was absolutely amazing to, to realize which part of the brain is focused on the self. That, that, was, that was really interesting. I really look forward to reading the papers. Um, so um, I would love to keep talking about this topic because that's amazing, but I have uh, other questions on the list as well. So let's just move on. Um, so the other ex very exciting project that you've been involved with that has made a lot of noise is the Dish Brain project. And I was wondering if you could uh, just give a intro into like what, what this project is about and what are you hoping to maybe achieve at the end of it? Yes, um, so this is, uh, I think, um, yes, yeah, so this is a project that uh, is led by uh, a small startup uh, uh, called Cortical Labs in Melbourne. Uh, and um, what, and I have been uh, a long time collaborator since 2018 with them. Um, so these, so, uh, Dr. Han Wong Chen and Dr. Andy uh, Kitchen and the CSO, Dr. Uh, Red Kagan. So these are the main people involved. Um, so they have, um, so in this project, the whole idea is this, that can we use uh, the computational power, the, the, the energy efficiency of actual neurons to do computation for us. So in a, in a neural network, an artificial, artificial neural network, we have these, the basic building block is an artificial neuron. An artificial neuron is just nothing, but which is, which is, it is a sort of a um, uh, device which takes some input and add some nonlinearity and give you an output. So this is basically a nonlinear uh, unit transformer in a sense. Um, while the human brain, uh, while well, not the human brain, uh, the human uh, brain cells, uh, they they are much more complex. While these artificial neurons are a kind of inspired by the human uh, brain cell, uh, but they are the neurons that the biological neurons are much more complicated. Uh, they have a very detailed and very complex anatomy. Yeah. Um, and, and how do they uh, process information and how they connect to other neurons um, and, and how, uh, you know, to synapses. Uh, it, it's, it's very complex. It's just, and, and, and unlike an artificial neural network, which works with zeros and one and binary uh, uh, input and output, it basically yeah, a, a, a neuron can also process debatable uh, but can do uh, you know continuous processes can 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 give inputs which are outputs which are weighted as well. So there's lots of and it can do at much lower energy efficiency. So can we use uh, the power of human brain cells? Can we harness that? Can we exploit that? Uh, and in a way that it does the computation. So, so that's the main idea. And for doing this, uh, what's being done is this, that uh, these neural cultures, these neurons, um, they're, uh, they're cultured in the, in, in the lab using stem cell technology, um, uh, human iPSC technology, where you can actually use, for example, cells from the skin 
and then they can be programmed to become cortical cells, for example. And once you have them, this technology, of course, is, is very standard now and lots of uh, vet labs around the world, they have, uh, they use these, uh, um, these sort of technologies of neural culturing in the lab. But the important point here, uh, the most important thing is this, what, what's being done here is this, that these neural cultures from, uh, from for example, from humans, uh, uh, donors, uh, they're cultured, they, they get mature, they, they should start to show when they start to show, um, you know, uh, regular firing patterns, as we see, usually see, uh, then they are plated or embedded on a high density multi electrode array surface. So there's like a electronic surface, which is a high definition sensors. Um, and then these neuron, these neuron, neurons are basically embedded on them. We, we, we just, you know, deposit them on the surface, and then and then they make connections there. These are uh, gold, or platinum, or platinum uh, plated sensors, and they make connections with these neurons. And once you have this, you, uh, there is a very low latency, real time feedback system is being developed where you can uh, sense from these neurons. Uh, uh, there are about thousand, there are about twenty six thousand sensors on the chip. Uh, the max one uh, chip that's being used. Uh, um, it had uh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, this chip has about 26,000 channels on it, but one can um, send uh, simultaneously um, sense uh, or, or read from uh, 1,024 channels. Not only we can do this, we can also write uh, to up to 32 channels as well. Um, so there is this low latency feedback uh, is being built by cortical labs. Um, and then, it, which means now, uh, with this real-time feedback loop, these neural cultures are now embodied. So they can now act on the world. So what we did was then, this is where the name comes from, dish and the brain, then the, the brain cells, which are put on an electronic dish. Um, and there's a load latency, real-time feedback loop. Um, and then, um, and then uh, we put the whole thing into a simulated game world. Uh, for example, uh, we showed that uh, these neural cultures can play game of Pong and they can um, get better at playing it over time. Um, so so that's so that's one of the first um, one can say demonstration of a neural computation device. Uh, while they have been as Serious studies which have looked at doing similar, but I think this is one of the most sophisticated and uh, you know study which showed that it is actually possible that here that we can use the power of brain cells, actual brain cells, uh, to do computation here. The computation is done by by the by the by the brain cells. Uh, with the help of the uh, you know electronics around it, which is of course silicon based, so it's a comp it's a hybrid system which uses human brain cells and also silicon computing um, to to do um, some sort of intelligent task like playing a game of pong. So, uh, I mean, thinking about fusing the world of biology and the world of artificial is just like I'm, 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 I'm sort of reading a science fiction novel or something. It's just amazing that things like this are happening. And um, even more amazing thing is that a startup, which, which would, could actually kickstart a project as uh, amazing as this. And sort of, uh, it's also sort of heartwarming to see that startups can work with institutions academic institutions to actually collaborate and develop amazing projects like this it's really um encouraging to hear um i was actually looking at the demo i think on cortical labs website on the actual pong game that was being played now, i don't know which part of uh, like at which stage of training uh, the neurons that particular video was captured at but what i noticed was the actual racket 
that was being moved, I presume, by, by the action potential shot from the actual neurons, what I noticed was it was hitting back the, the ball with minimum effort. Like if it could just hit the ball just with the edge of the racket, it would do so. It wouldn't uh, sort of maximize, let's say, certainty in terms of let, let's always hit the ball with the midpoint of the racket. It was always like at the edge. So it wouldn't move if not necessary. Uh, the, it wouldn't move the racket. That was very... That's probably what we do uh, as lazy creatures, <laughs> try to, to conserve energy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The, 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 probably, maybe there is no accident there, as you said. Um, maybe <laughs> you, you, we have a bunch of uh, lazy neurons that sort of, you know, combine and create this lazy brain that becomes the self and then we are lazy we want to do everything with minimum effort <laughs> okay so that's amazing let's also uh, now move a little more towards the other activities and research interests in your lab uh, which is about dynamic causal modeling or dcm now as we know dcm speaks to the fact that in order to make sense of brain imaging data like eeg or mg you need a model of how a part of the system influences the other part and vice versa. Now, could you please explain in more detail what DCM is and what are the fundamental challenges in applying DCM to model certain components of human cognition, such as creativity or even connecting back to the magic mushroom uh, project, even, uh, you know, the, applying DCM to understand consciousness even yeah um so dynamic causal modeling is a bayesian framework uh, for understanding and interpreting dynamic systems like brain um or infectious diseases like covid uh, so there was a recent extension where we actually used dcm framework to uh, explain um, um, COVID spread as well. Uh, but of course, this was initially developed to understand and interpret uh, dynamics of a, of a, of a, of a uh, neural dynamics. Um, um, it is often uh, um, employed for modeling what we call effective connectivity, uh, which is based on neural imaging data and it extends traditional models by considering not just the static relationships uh, between variables, but also their dynamic interactions, which I think is the key thing here. Uh, you can think of it as a, uh, as, as, um, um, as a way to uh, look at, uh, as a way to interpret time series data as well. And if I connect it back to a very, much of an engineering concepts. Um, basically, what we are doing is uh, is basically a state space modeling exercise. Yeah. Um, now, um, the main idea here is this: that can we actually infer the latent activity in the brain? That the the measurements that we have from either from fMRI or EEG, they are. Uh, they are indirect measures of neural connectivity. We are not actually measuring where the thing, where the action is happening, but we are measuring the the data from a distance. It is very similar to like you know in ocean engineering where people would like to uh, monitor activity at the depth of the seabed, uh, where you cannot put the sensors, you know, kilometers inside, but what you do is you have sensors at the top of the, you know, at the surface of the water, and then you try to measure what might be happening, um, you know, kilometers inside the sea, or similarly in seismology, uh, where, you know, uh, there are tremors and, and earthquakes which are happening in the depth of the earth crust, uh, but you are measuring it on the surface of the earth itself, you know. Um, so this is more like, uh, you know, uh, so how if you have measurements and indirect measurements of some activity, in this case, for example, neural activity, but which you cannot directly measure, for this to directly measure, you have to do some 
surgical procedures, which are not always possible. So here we are using MRI or EEG, which are non-invasive, to get these measurements of neural activity. Now DCM is providing us with this uh, framework where we can infer what might be happening at the neural level um, by using measurements which are uh, from the from the from the scalp. Yeah? Uh, for this, we need to have a model. So we need to define a generative model of what might have caused to get what we have measured with MRI. So, so we have the observations, but what we are trying to infer using DCM are the causes of those observations or those data. So here we are trying to do something what so for this to 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 work, we need to have a forward model that what happened at the neural level, um, what so if there's an input which entered, for example, a visual stimulus or an auditory stimulus which enters the you know through our senses into the brain, then it uh, then it impacts uh, how different parts of the brain are working together. So, you know, it impacts their connectivity, their neural dynamics, which, which get changed uh, by the external stimulus. Um, and then um, it passes through the dissonal activity to the hemodynamics, for example, uh, or the plumbing of the brain. And then you measure indirectly you know for example mri is change is just measuring uh the changes in the in, in the in the oxygenation in the oxygen levels of the blood so those part of the of the of the of the brain which are working harder they will use more oxygen they will need more energy and that's what the mri is or the bold signal blood oxygen level detection uh this is the the name bold signal that where it comes from is just measuring that so can we now use the this, this, these measurements, which are indirect measurements, to actually now infer um, what might, what are the causes of those data, and that's what we do with DCM. Now, you have asked me that how it can be used to understand things like creativity and consciousness, right? Now, um, yeah. So first of all, uh, these processes are very complex processes. Consciousness is one of the most complex. Uh, thing what that that you know we have encountered it's a hard problem uh, you know um, so uh, these of course dynamic cause of modeling in a sense the limitation here is this that the MRI or EEG uh, the inherent uh, limitation to uh, capture those processes yeah because DCM is it is a, is a statistical mathematical tool it's it's not about uh, so it doesn't change anything it's just trying to understand what might be happening uh so um so what i would uh, say is this that um uh, it, it, dcm is is basically better suited for predicting brain states given certain inputs rather than explaining how these states lead to complex cognitive processes. So basically, you know, um, I think, so, the, so, 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 so while we, you know, we use DCM to understand, uh, you know, as I was explaining in the previous, uh, in, in one of your previous questions that understand what might be happening in the brain when people are having these altered states of consciousness. Yeah. So, so, so DCM is very useful in that sense that you can actually, while people are having these experiences, these altered states of, of uh, you know, uh, states, then, then at that time, we can see how different parts of the brain are communicating with each other. If I give you an example of, of, of a study that we did, which was published in 2019 in, in PNAS. Um, so there's a small part in the brain, which is called thalamus. It is a very deep down, is a subcortical region. And um, there is uh, this, a uh, theory which is called filtration theory, which says that thalamus is a is a is sort of a gatekeeper or a filter uh, to uh, which which filters 
uh, all the stimulus or the information that is entering the brain. So, so right now we are getting a lots of information, lots of stimulus which is entering the brain, and 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 thalamus is something a brain structure which actually controls that how much of this information gets to the cortex. Um, thalamus is a subcortical region. It's 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 where you know it, it it in a sense controls how much of information should be routed to cortex, and in the cortex will make sense of that information. Yeah, so so this is called a filtration theory, and then thalamus as a gatekeeper. So what, for example, now what we showed in 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 our work, which used dynamic causal modeling, is this that under psychedelic effect with especially with LSD in this case uh, thalamus was uh, uh, it it opened the it, it got opened it, it became like a gatekeeper which opens all the the gate so under psychedelics lots of information is started to flow into the cortex and there's kind of a what we call the information overload and those those that that information uh, overload and lots of information that got routed to the cortex which usually is not the case under under the normal condition without drug uh, people start to see you know hallucinations and, and and all those things happen so here what we showed with DCM is this that the connectivity from thalamus to the cortex was increased. So there was a more communication between thalamus and the and the and the cortex. Yeah. So this is one of the ways that DCM can be used uh, to understand these conscious processes. Yeah. Um, so so that's that's as an example uh, I'm giving that how you can use it to understand uh, the neural mechanisms which might be at play when people are having different sort of conscious experiences so, so by looking at dcm at work you can understand like, like okay there's an overload of information here and so like the edge between this brain this part of the brain region and this part this part of the brain region think that there, there's a there's a jump in the weight in the in the edge for example and mm -hmm. uh in the actual uh, functional I think connection, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, exactly. So what you could infer is this that there's a more uh, connectedness between, for example, thalamus and uh, and and cortex or some some areas in the cortex. So, so there's more there's more connectivity. There's which means that there's is increased capacity for the information to flow. Yeah. So it's like yeah. So so it's like. Uh, the highway is broadened. It is a more broad highway where more traffic can now go, uh, but it's reversible as well. So it can shrink down once the psychedelic effect goes away. Uh, that connectivity would come back to the to to what it was before. Yeah. So that's that's the that's the good thing about psychedelic drugs that they can we we can we can induce these um, altered states. But they can be reversed back as well, so we yeah so uh, and we can and, and in that in that experimental work empirical finding we showed that you know the connectivity was increased under LSD, but it was not as much when you know when there was no drug. So so this is one way that one can show with DCM um, that. Uh, um, uh, you know, it, it gives a clue about what might be happening at the neural level when people are having hallucinations, for example. So what I would also be interested to know is that um, so while the hot, the highway is getting sort of wider, so the hallucinations would start over a lot of information. But what I would also be interested to know is that as the effect of psychedelics would wear off. And the highway sort of narrows down again. What? How would that manifest itself in the perception of of, of of people? Like, would they just, as expected, just begin to feel gradually normal, or is there a shock? Yes. Where is the overload of information? I'm used to this much information. Yeah. 
So what happens, for example, with psilocybin, um, the experience lasts between half an hour to four hours, depending on individuals. So when we did these, experience, uh, these experiments, um, uh, usually uh, we have a participant in our lab for a whole, uh, you know, eight hours. We give them this drug, uh, for example, psilocybin in this case, uh, then it takes about uh, uh, about an hour uh, for these um, compounds to take effect, and 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 in a sense, those you know neural chain changes to occur, um, and then slowly people start to see effects of uh, you know some people would have synesthesia where they would be uh, seeing from their uh, from the nose and smelling from their eyes you know so, so these kind of things that can happen not that everyone feel that some people will feel them in a different way um so there are lots of things that that might be happening um in one of them the most uh, most pronounced and everyone almost everyone that uh, reports is is the very vivid experience the visual hallucination is I think the one of the most uh, you know uh, most reported and robust um, you know uh, thing that people report is the visual changes um, that happens. But it as I said, it only happens for for uh, you know anything between half an hour to three four hours, and then it starts to the half life of these compounds is like you know it is in hours like that, and then it slowly you come back to, you become sober again, yeah. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, so we talked about psychedelics, we talked about dynamic causal modeling. Now let's jump into the other venue uh, that is active inference, which is another major uh -huh. piece of your research. Um, so could you please explain uh, what active inference is? I know we can talk for hours about it, but the very, very basic uh, sort of definition of what active inference is, is hand, and how it can actually help us understand the fundamental principles of decision making in biological systems. How correlated is it? Or let's say, how good is it in really explaining decision making in actual biological brains like, such as ourselves? Yeah. Uh, so active inference is a is a theoretical framework uh, primarily rooted in free energy principle, uh, which has been proposed as a unified theory of learning and decision making in biological systems. Uh, the core cool idea here is that the biological systems from single cells to more complex organisms like humans, uh, they strive to minimize surprise or uncertainty of free energy, a major, which is a major, as I said, a major of the system's uncertainty or surprise about its sensory states. By doing so, the system uh, maintains a, a state of equilibrium with its environment. So when we are minimizing surprise, we are trying to maintain our internal, ex the expectations that we have uh, with in sync with the reality of the world. So basically, active inference is, is coming from uh, a free energy principle, but it provides a mathematical, theoretical framework to, to operationalize this idea of free energy minimization or the uncertainty minimization. So that's, um, that's the core idea, but how does it do it? you know, how we minimize surprise or how how we minimize, um, you know, free energy to be in equilibrium with our environment is through, um, uh, through uh, what we think by keeping a generative model. Yeah. And this is where I think the, the active inference is so powerful uh, because um, uh, what we are saying is this, that the brain is maintaining a generative model of its environment. And decisions are made by updating this model to minimize free energy. 
And by doing this, we are essentially choosing the action that leads to the least surprising or the most expected outcome based on the model or the based on the generative model. So this is, you know, this is, I think, the core uh, idea here of active inference that we keep that, that, that the brains or any system which survives over time keeps a generative model which it updates over time. Um, so, um, so, so, and, 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 and the idea that the brain is constantly updates its generative model by minimizing the prediction error or, or uncertainty or free energy or the, or the log marginal likelihood, they're all the same thing. Um, we are, which we define as a difference between the expected and the actual sense the observations yeah so this is this is how we define in this in this uh, in this uh, you know setting um we call um the free energy uh, which is basically um thing you can think of as a prediction error, which is just nothing the difference between the expected and the actual sensory uh, observations now there are a few other components of active inference for example action selection uh, so this is an important uh, part of how humans, for example, or other organisms survive um, in, in active inference. Um, actions are uh, selected not just to uh, attain certain goals, uh, but to resolve uncertainty. Uh, and this this one can thought of as the systems uh, as a system or organism um, actively seeking out states that are easier to predict, uh, thereby reducing free energy. Yeah, um, and and then we also say that it's a is is a system in comparison to um, other um, frameworks like reinforcement learning, which are reward based. Here we are talking about perceptual inference. The system is basically updating its beliefs of the internal states to minimize free energy given new sensory data. Uh, and, and this is what we refer to as perceptual inference. Um, and, and so as I said, active inference is a, is, is a theory of, 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 uh, of uh, learning and decision-making, which is action and perception and decision-making and an action selection. Uh, but also there is something what we call planning as well. So in this one work, we have planning uh, and, and, and which, which requires future predictions. Uh, and fit from this, uh, there's an important um, aspect of temporal depth, depth that comes from that how uh, deep in time you can you can you can do planning um, and, 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 and do policy selection. So um, in active inference, it also allows for planning over multiple time steps. Uh, just like if you are to play a game of chess, you would like to plan that how uh, a good chess player would be able to 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 plan very deeply. You know, in in maybe six or eight or ten, um, you know, um, turns in in future. That if I do this, then someone else, that the, the opponent would do these, I can take these actions, and then for every action, I can take this action. And you can see that how complex it could be as soon as you try to go deeper in, in, into this planning. So I think uh, um, the temporal depth, depth that we can also model and do policy selection with active infants is also an important part. So I know you asked me a simple answer, but the the, the 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 simple answer is this that active inference is is about a, a a a framework which integrates learning and decision making um uh, in a way that how a biological system would do it mm -hmm. and uh, to our machine learning uh, community out there who might be interested in the active inference and dr Raza, you can correct me if i'm wrong but as far as i've understood one of the learning algorithms out there in the world of machine learning that we've always thought of something that is mimicking how a biological being would act uh, or sort of uh, 
ex acts as if it's uh, it, it is sort of mimicking a biological being is reinforcement learning. Uh, there's this sort of interesting, relatable concept of exploration and exploitation. But to compare active inference with uh, reinforcement learning, um, it seems to me that reinforcement learning is a very special case of active inference where we don't have the concept of shrinkage in uncertainty in the objective function. So that, that idea of uh, uncertainty about the world around me doesn't um, automatically jump out of the objective function or the value function, let's say, that we want to max maximize. It's all about, uh, as far as I know, maximizing the expected reward and choosing actions so that would maximize the expected reward. And one has to artificially embed a measure of uncertainty reduction or belief about the world into the objective function. Whereas when, when you develop the objective function of active inference, that is the expected free energy from scratch, the, the actual um, uncertainty reduction term jumps out organically and completely automatically and it's there. Yes, exactly. I, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, in reinforcement learning, as you said, uh, it models decision making as a process of optimizing the world over time. Um, so that's what it is doing. So, and for doing this, there should be uh, the objective function. We should be able to uh, to um, write out our reward function. Um, so, and and the black art in a sense here is this: that how do you write your reward function? And which which may not be possible in all situations. Uh, in contrast, what we are saying in active inference um, uh, that uh, that when you are minimizing free energy, as you said, it organically does what the reinforcement learning is doing without the need to always all the time write a, a new objective function, uh, a reward function, uh, which which actually in many situations may not be available as well. Uh, so um, while, you know, the reinforcement learning models can be, uh, actually, we can actually integrate them, uh, the reinforcement learning into active inference. Um, uh, but although they often lack the hierarchical, the multi-scale approach, and the strong focus on prediction and uncertainty that active inference has in in it um, intrinsically. So, so here we are modeling uncertainty and the multi-scale, the hierarchical nature of our interactions with the environment. This is all you know very inherent in active inference, which is not as um, you know easy to do in reinforcement learning um so yeah yeah that's amazing um yeah i i'm certainly hoping to see more people uh, getting involved in working with active inference and especially the comparison between active inference and reinforcement learning particularly model-based reinforcement learning would be very interesting okay so i know that um active inference uh, could have some limitations and one of them, uh, I think, is scalability. And I know that uh, you've recently uh, authored, uh, or I better say co-authored a paper, a preprint on to solve sort of the scalability problem with active inference. Could you maybe in general talk about the challenges of applying active inference in the real world? And if you want to uh, please also elaborate on mm -hmm. this, um, a scalability issue and how one can go around it. Yes, uh, when you, I think what you are referring to is this, that while active inference is a very comprehensive framework, but can we use this in real world, um, you know, um, uh, in real world settings? And if we can, um, you know, that would be amazing. But, uh, you know, there are certain limitations and hurdles. Uh, the issue here is this detective inference uh, 
tells you that which quantity to minimize or optimize, which is a variation free energy, but how do you do so on a silicon device? On a you know, uh, the way that brain is, is doing this, we actually don't know. I think that's the main, I think one of the main um, uh, interest of mine is to understand how it's being implemented so efficiently and less power hungry way in the brain. But currently what, because we don't know how it's done, we are trying to implement this on an artificial system, which is a computer, right? So which means that we need to now find ways to optimize this, how to implement this optimization of free energy uh, you know, in a way that it is suitable to be executed on a computing device as we have now. Yeah. So that's where the, the problem is. The, imp the, the problem is the implementation, the how to, to, to implement this optimization compared to how the brain is doing. So now um, if I if I now go into that, what are those limitations? As you said, one of the biggest one is the computational complexity. Um, so, so, so the computational cost that it it, it has, uh, especially when you have to model, uh, you know, more complex and uh, and and high dimensional state spaces. So usually, um, most of the examples in literature that you see in active inference uh, is where people are solving very simple tasks uh, of uh, of may of of uh, you know solving a maze which is a small a four by four maze or a, a mountain car problem. So these are problems where, or even a pong game. Uh, these are, are um, in problems which are, you know, um, with very small estate space. But as soon as in a real world, or even if uh, the maze got bigger, if you have to solve a maze which is like uh, 20 by 20 or, or 30 by 30 or 50 by 50, uh, a larger maze, then the state space is big, right? So how do you, how the um, the policy search that you are trying to find what is the optimal action to take in future, which would minimize the, uh, the, the, the average free energy in future, how do you take that action, right? For this, you need to calculate many different uh, you know policies so you need to to search through a very large policy space uh, currently it's being done by using a tree search um uh, so what we have proposed um, um is to use less complex uh, way which is uh, which is linear in time and this is called dynamic programming in machine learning so we have used uh, um, dynamic programming to do uh, planning backward in time. So that's that's uh, where you you start. Uh, you know, you go in the future, and then um, you can you know do the the planning backward in time. It, it, it's much more much more. Um, you know, it, it's computationally very inexpensive. Um, compared to a full tree search, which is, you know, which which just explodes as soon as you have, uh, especially with with with, with uh, temporal horizon or temporal death going, you know, uh, is, is deep, you know. Um, so the, I think one of the main problems that we have is the complex computational complexity, uh, but there are many other things as well. For example, um, one needs to write a generative model for every problem that you are trying to solve, you know? So if you are to write, if you if you have something like a mountain car problem, and then you have written out your generative model, but now you cannot take this and do this for you know same do the same thing for a maze uh, or, or, or 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 you know a cart pull or whatever problem that you are trying to solve next you need to always every time you need to write a new generative model so i think um, model specification deciding on the right generative model for a given application is a non trivial thing and that's one of the impediment for the higher uptake of active inference by the machine learning community 
Um, then um, if you are, you know, looking at uh, more real world problems, uh, then there is a lot of data sparsity and uncertainty in the real world. Uh, so, um, uh, so, so we need to develop models which are very robust. While it is very uh, natural for active inference to model uncertainty, but to develop more robust models, you know, which can work in highly uncertain environments. I think there is some there's a gap that that we need to fill in there as well. Um, Inter agent variability. So, uh, if if we are to build uh, these models in a social context or multi-agent systems, then accounting, but then for accounting for variability in beliefs, um, preferences and actions, and uh, you know, they they it, it's very challenging. Um, so so that that's another thing. If you are to apply this in a social context, then you know. Um, there are ways that one can deal with this, for example, by having uh, by choosing appropriate prior preferences. Um, so one can do this uh, as well. So so there are you know um, there are several limitations currently, and that's why it's an exciting field where we have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. um, so one 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 of the things that you mentioned about. Um this whole scalability issue, I was thinking if having adversarial active inference agents in mm. the system could help us sort of summarize this intractable environment somehow, the same way when, so when we are trying to build a simple binary classifier in machine learning, you need some sort of balance set of positive and negative samples to tune the boundary between the two classes. Now, I wonder if we have other energy minimizing agents or active inference agents in the environment with whom we have a common narrative in terms of we are all sort of bounded by the by the rules of this world. However, their objective is to maximize my surprise, let's say, and I want to minimize my surprise. Maybe that sort of push from the other side of the boundary would help me. Uh, sort of summarize the world or maybe even the policy space that I need to search. Yes, I think um, I, I I'm not sure that if anyone is working on this, so it could so adversarial, you know, um, the competition between agents where they are competing uh, to um, to do the same task, um, and and there is a um, you know there's a there's a push and pull, there's a there is a tension between between uh, you know this adversarial collaboration um i think that's a very you know i think that's that the cooperation and also coordination and also some uh, you know uh, uh, yeah uh, some competition um so so i think these are all great ideas that one could look to exploit Okay, that's perfect. So uh, the, the final question that I have is uh, that there are some uh, criticisms about active inference. One of them is that some believe that active inference's approach to action selection can be overly deterministic, especially because mm -hmm. our world could be governed by some highly stochastic processes or even highly chaotic processes. Um, in your opinion, how does it how does active inference deal with true stochastic or chaotic environments where deterministic pre uh, predictions may fail? Yeah, that's a very good one. I think, um, so as we have been discussing, active inference acknowledges the role of uncertainty and aims to minimize it through the free energy principle. So, um, a, so in a truly chaotic or stochastic environment, um, active inference uses probabilistic models that are inherently that inherently account for the some level of uncertainty, um, and these could include stochastic or uh, or even chaotic elements. Um, 
it also allows for continual learning or continual updating of the generative model. So, so if there's a lots of stochasticity or, or, or even chaotic dynamics, because the model is adaptive, you know, so there's a continuous up, uh, belief updating which is happening. There's a there's an action perception cycle. Um, so uh, the updating of this generative model based on incoming data, making it adaptable to changes or unpredictable environment, as I think is the key. Uh, then also um, active inference as inherently, as you said before, um, it just not, it doesn't just only does the exploitation of known strategies, but it also explores new ones as well, uh, which is particularly useful in stochastic settings. Um, also, um, active inference uh, can use hierarchical modeling. So you could, uh, in a complex environment, a uh, hierarchical model can 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 manage different levels of uncertainty and stochasticity from lower level sensory noise to higher level uh, uh, vol uh, vol uh, volatility in the environment as well. So so there are many different ways that you know active inference can. Um, survive an agent which is which is based on active inference can survive in highly stochastic and uh, and chaotic environments. Uh, another one which is like basically uh, adapting or implementing uh, risk aversion or risk seeking. Uh, so model can be tuned to be more risk covers or more risk seeking uh, depending on the context um, and this allows for different strategies in environments with variable le with variable level levels of unpredictability um, and then also instead of of uh, of deterministic actions uh, one can uh, in active inference one can evaluate a range of action policies uh, and their expected free energies, um, uh, which provides a more nuanced approach to action selection in uncertain settings. So there, there are multiple ways that one can use uh, to 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 uh, to develop the active inference agents in highly stochastic and and chaotic environments. That's very interesting, because especially uh, when it comes to chaotic systems, as far as I know, uh, the main characteristics of such systems, like Lorenz Attractor, as an example, is that like the system is highly, highly, highly sensitive to the initial conditions. A very, very small error in how you start the system could really result in exponential divergence into the trajectories through which you would sort of travel through time. Um, but what I think, I'm no expert in dynamic systems, but what I've learned so far about them is that there seems to be a difference between, say, when we say a chaotic, chaotic system and traveling through a chaotic system versus an active inference agent that unfolds in time into the future. And it seems to me that the difference is that the active inference agent is actually receiving data and it can update the generative model. So if there is an error that is sort of increasing by the data that's receiving, it can sort of train itself. I know it says inference, but it's also, I think, training the generative model's parameters. But as far as I know, when we're talking about a stochastic dynamic system or a chaotic dynamic system, it's all about uh, so sort of integrating a differential equation to time and see like the trajectories that would emerge and they say that they diverge. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as 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 you are saying, the main that the key thing is is that one can adapt the generative model, and the generative model, of course, in this case would uh, be you know made up of uh, you know. Um, differential equations which are you know um, which are modeling the 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 the, the, the stochastic dynamic the chaotic dynamics uh example you gave of Lorentz attractor which is very classic uh, you know example um so i think as you said you know i think the key here is the adaptability the 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 the, 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 the cycle where you are learning from the consequences of your actions so what you did did it work or not 
and then you get the uh, get the feedback and then you change and then you can adaptively look for different policies you know? so i think this is all in the, in the adaptive uh, nature of this uh, that you have action policies which which you can then you can then take uh, to to minimize you know uh, the the future free energy uh, based on what you just sensed uh, so this adaptability i think uh, is is the key is the key component yes perfect so we we've, we've reached to the end of our questions i mean i, I could talk to you forever but uh, we need to stop at some point and i just wanted to um really thank you for being with us today at ML Done, and I really, really enjoyed talking with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was so much fun and uh, looking forward to more interactions in the future. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you.